Good morning, friends. Would you join me for the call to worship? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. For he satisfies the thirsty, and the hungry he fills with good things. Let us worship God. Let us pray. God, who knows us and loves us, all of us have been hurt and broken by promises. The promises like diets that promise to give us uh, the perfect body for summer, which seems to work only momentarily. Sure, investments fail when a recession hits. Significant others who promise to always love us sometimes disappear. God, everything we give our hearts to and put our trust in will likely fail us one day, except for you. Out of love, you brought us into this world and have been a constant companion in it. Not a day has gone by that you did not journey alongside us. Not a moment of our lives has ever been, um, have you ever been absent from us. Because of this, Lord, we give to you this morning all of ourselves, our love, our devotion, 
and even our very lives, because you are worthy of receiving them. Amen. Friends, God never gives up on us, but sometimes we give up on God. God calls us, but we don't hear it because we're busy listening to the voices of others. So let us return our attention to God by confessing our sins through the prayer of confession. Your prophet has spoken your words to us. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. However, the more you called us, the more you went to me and offered us sacrifices to other God. Yet it was I who taught them to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. But we have to rage in our cities, and we devoured each other with our schemes. We turned away from you. Will you give us up, O Lord? Pray and compassion will grow warm and tender once more. And you will forgive us and restore us to loving presence. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Friends, God's love is not something that we earn. It's something that is freely given to each of us. Even when our own love for God wanes, God's love for us remains constant. Hear me this morning. It doesn't matter how bad your disobedience have been. God is always ready, willing, and even anxious to receive us again in love. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now, as a forgiven family of God, let us say together what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Friends, Christ came to this world to bring peace to us, and we are invited into sharing that peace with one another. So peace be with you. Amen. Now turn and share peace with one another.
The first reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to, <coughs> said to him, Lord, said to him, Friend, <coughs> who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The word of the Lord. Beloved, as we prepare to lean on the everlasting arms of God in prayer, I invite you to look in your bulletin at the list of people who are on there asking for our prayers, for those who have been on an ongoing list. We ask for your prayers for the family of Alberta Tonks, who passed away and for Adrian Heiser and her family at the death of Paul Heiser. Paul's funeral will be held at Freedom Village this Saturday, August 10th at 11 a.m. We also raise up for your attention our mission partners, Doug Dix, who works in the Middle East with building relationships there, and Peter Grimm, who works at Cornerstone. Loving God, we are much in need of your guidance. When we wobble and fall, stand us up and help us walk again with cords of human kindness and bands of love. We pray for the church and for all who teach others with kindness, firm guidance, and love. We pray for peace among nations and peace between people. We pray for those suffering the scourge of war and calamities of nature. Protect the lives of those who fight and flee wildfires 
and the animals that must seek shelter from the same. We pray for all those in need, especially women and children who suffer domestic violence and homelessness. We pray for those who are ill, their families and their caregivers. We especially name today Jean, Carol, Carl, Johnson, Magali, Helen, Nicole, Doris, Trisha, Frank, Jane, Bill, Fred, Elizabeth, Sydney, and David. We pray for those who mourn today. Heal the hearts of Leslie Manili, who grieves the loss of her mother, Alberta Tonks. Heal the hearts of Adrian Heiser, as she and her family grieve the loss of Paul, beloved husband and father. We pray for the victims and survivors of the two mass shootings that happened yesterday in El Paso, Texas, and in Dayton, Ohio. We pray for those who refuse to give, who have more than enough, but choose to build up bonds in which to hoard instead of help. We raise up for your continued blessings those who reach out to bring the kingdom of God to this place. Bless Peter Grimm and Doug Dix. Lord, you speak gently to us, saying, I am to them like those who lift their infants to their cheeks. Help us to remember that we are your beloved children. Loving God, through Jesus Christ, you nurture and nourish us. You love us with a steadfast love, low and high, rich and poor together. Renew us in your call and release us from all fear, that we may heed these things and consider your steadfast love for all. We unite these petitions and the ones that we have secreted away in the silent corners of our hearts, in the prayer Christ taught us to offer us together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would like to invite the younger church to come forward. Come on up and come and sit on the steps. Good morning, good morning. I wonder how many of you know what a piggy bank is? Only, only a few of you know, a, oh, okay. What is a piggy bank? What's it for? It's a place to store your change and money. It's a place to store your change and money. Hmm, that sounds good. And what do you do with that money? Save it. Oh, I like this child. Yeah. <laughs> you save it. Um, what about this? Does anybody know what this is? What is it? It's a purse. Oh, I love that English word, purse. In America, they call it a wallet, but that's okay. Yes, it's a purse. 
What do you think is in this purse? Money. Oh, I am okay. Let's 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 see. Yay, money. Um, what's that? It's a one hundred dollar bill. Um, okay, it's just a representative of a one hundred dollar <laughs> bill. It's not real. And please, elders, uh, we are not printing money in the church. Don't worry. <laughs> It's a $100 bill, and that's what we might expect to find in, in our bank accounts, in our piggy banks, in our purses. But the story that we heard this morning was Jesus telling people not to bank on possessions, not the things that we own, but rather we should bank in a special bank, the bank of heaven. And we do this by doing different things. I have some money that I'd like to hand up. Well, it's not real money, but it's money that has things on it. And if some of you would like to read what your money says, that would be wonderful. So, I think we might have enough for everybody. Anybody want to start? What does your money say? Share your food. Share your food. Aha. Uh -huh. What else can we do? Love God. Love God. Share your clothes. Share your clothes. Visit the sick. Visit the sick. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, my goodness. All these wonderful things that we can do, and those are ways that we can bank our tithes in heaven. This is what Jesus wants us to do. And so we're to share our food, share our clothes, share the things that we have, pray for each other, love one another, and love God. And so let us join our hearts in prayer as we prepare to go to Sunday school. Let us pray. God, you give us so much more than we could ever imagine, more than all the money and the fake money that we could ever have. We ask for your blessings as we go out to spread the love of Jesus to this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we send you out with blessings as you go to Sunday school.
Please be seated. Friends, grace to and peace from God our Father and from God's beloved Jesus Christ. It is wonderful to see you here this morning. If you are a guest with us, we're grateful that you're here. If we could do anything to make our church into a church for you, please don't hesitate to ask. We'd love to introduce you to some new friends or suggest a Sunday school class or just explain how it is we go about things here. One of the things that we do is we find the ritual of friendship pad. It's on the edge of your pew toward the center aisle. Let us know that you're here. Share it with the others on your row and then pass it back. And take a look and see who you're sitting with so you can greet each other by name after the service. We'd love a little information about you if you are a guest, perhaps an email address so we can reach out to you. Let you know the things that are coming up. We are deep into planning for our next program year, which starts in September. So lots to be had and going on at that point. At this point though, I just uh, remind you to, to take a look at the bulletin and see a few of the things that are coming up. There are two things that start or one that starts next week and one that happens next week. So next week there is the trip to Stonely Gardens, which will happen after the service. That's the third and final trip of the garden series over the summer. You don't have to have been to the first two to go to this one, uh, but take a look and see if that's a way that you would like to enjoy some fellowship with your church family. And then next week actually starts a sermon series. It's a sermon series that we've done before. It's the perspective series. And what happens is over the next four weeks, you'll hear four different preachers speak from the same text, the still small voice that Elijah hears of God. The Reverend uh, Dr. Ann Clark Duncan will be our first preacher next week, and then it'll be me, and then Chinny, and then uh, Kelly Masters will uh, end up on the final week. So come join us for that series as we build toward uh, the fall um, and finally, one, one last announcement, which is that we still do need a few more teachers for our elementary Sunday school classes. If that is something that you think you might be able to do, please give it some thought and some prayer. If that's something you think you might want to do, but you've never been trained in that, and you don't know for sure how to do it, let me assure you that you would be first working with a team of people so that you don't have the entire class by yourself. But there is also... Um, an opportunity for training and teaching uh, for yourself to go into that. So if that's something that you feel God might be calling you to, please let one of us know on staff. Kelly's not here this weekend, but she'll be back soon, and you can also speak to her directly. Uh, friends, all we have truly is a gift from God. So let's return a portion of what God has given us in our morning offering.
Gracious God, we live in an area that has been blessed greatly. Many of us have accumulated great wealth and other blessings like freedom, education, meaningful careers, family, friends, and more. But even as we enjoy the blessings that you've given us, help us to never replace you in our hearts as our ultimate blessing. For you have been the giver of all good things in our lives. So because of this, we give to you thanks and praise for the ways that you have showered blessings on us. And we give back to you some of what you first gave us. May you bless these tithes given this morning, that they may be used to bless others. Amen. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from Hosea 11. I invite you to listen for this word from God. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king. Because they have refused to return to me, the sword rages in their cities, it consumes their oracle priests, and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. ancient prophets. They were not just future tellers. Ancient prophets were more like our modern day constitutional scholars. Let's call them covenantal scholars. They knew every jot and tittle of the covenant that people had made with God. Now covenant is new language for you. Let me explain. The covenant was the social contract. God boils it down to its essence in a number of places in the Old Testament, but it goes like this, you will be my people and I will be your God. You'll be my people and I will be your God. And I will be your God when whatever terrible happens, happens. And you will be my my people regardless. You won't forget me when And much of the Old Testament, Testament actually means covenant, much of the Old Testament is an elaboration of this basic covenant. The Ten Commandments, for instance, follows the covenantal formula, wherein the party of the first part, God, protects the party of the second part, in this case, Israel. It begins with a declaration of who God is and why God is qualified. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, who brought you out of the house of slavery. It's a pretty good qualification, right? 
In exchange, the party of the second part agrees to certain stipulations, certain restrictions on how they behave, certain commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the most important. That's why it's first. But then there's keep the Sabbath, respect mom and dad, don't murder, don't covet, etc., etc. Usually at the end of this type of covenant, there are blessings and curses to follow. They're absent from Exodus 20, but if you want a sample, you can dip into Deuteronomy 27 and 28. What they are are the blessings, the rewards for following the covenant, and the curses for ignoring it, the punishment. And there's no jury to adjudicate this. It is God who will decide. And the one who will bring the charges against the people, well, that's part of the role of the prophet. Maybe the primary role of the prophet. Now, if this were true, and it is, but if this were true, you would expect to see certain evidence of this. You would expect to see something like a courtroom scene littered throughout the prophets. And that's exactly what you get. Let me walk you through a typical one. It, it starts with the calling of the witnesses. They're not who you expect. They're not great Aunt Myrtle and old man Gustafson. They're people, well, they're not people actually, there are things that have extended far beyond one generation. When God calls witnesses, they are the mountains. They are the sky. There are things that have persisted long enough that they can witness to God's abiding faithfulness over the eons. This is when, why when the Pharisees come out to Jesus, wishing to quiet his disciples, he says, I tell you, even if these were quiet, the stones would cry out. That's why Joshua sets up stones as a memorial for where the people entered into the promised land. And so it would tell the story for generations, unlike 